Well, it's amazing because I've I worked in the space industry my whole life, and I was worried when I went up, it'd be jaded or that I, you know, I'd be desensitized to it. But it was more beautiful and more dazzling than I could ever have imagined. I'm even struggling to find the words to describe it to people because it was, it was just the most brilliant blue thing I've ever seen. The Earth and the atmosphere. Um, I struggle to find the words to to tell you how amazing it was. Was it different to what you'd imagined? There were some differences, yeah. Um, I was surprised how bright the atmosphere is. It was, to me, it looked like a brilliant sapphire or something hanging, like a a sapphire shield over the earth. And, you know, if you look at like a photo, like the one behind me, it's just usually, you know, in photos, it comes across as like a a blue gradient and it doesn't do it justice at all. all. The other crazy thing is when you're out at at 106 kilometers, I think where we were, um, which is just above the edge of space, you can see all around you about 1,200 kilometers in every direction. So you have like a 2,400 kilometer cone underneath you, which you can see that much of the Earth in one go. And I think our primitive human brains aren't designed to look at that. So it was really spooky and, and almost um, like almost felt like an out-of-body experience to, to be able to see the world in that context. Yeah. I mean, you talk about it. Did you feel a disconnect? Did you feel like you should be connecting in this way with the Earth? Well, actually, the, the thing that really excited me was the space part and looking out into the blackness of space. It was the blackest black as well. What was amazing is all these colors I'd never seen before. You know, on Earth, through filtered through the atmosphere, the sunlight is not the same as it is up there. And so space was very, very black, blacker than the blackest paint we've ever made. And I'd never seen that color or not color before. And for me, I felt just this pull, almost like a visceral pull from my chest out into space saying, this is where we belong. And, and um, I think it's kind of, for me, reaffirmed my knowledge of myself that I'm a space guy and I, I want to go again. I want to go back and I want to go further and deeper into space. It's very exciting out there. Yeah, you say this is where we belong, but for many, the optics of these two billionaires spending so much money going to space when the world here is in desperate need of attention just with climate change. What do you say to those people? I think that's a little bit of a, a misunderstanding because the world needs both things to happen. The, you know, if you think of the human race as a as a large hive, we both need nurturers and we need explorers. And um, you know, even in in Britain in the you know 15, 16, 17 centuries, sailors were sailing around the world exploring, bringing back really nice things. Now I acknowledge that we're still dealing with some of the the consequences of colonialism. But also we invented really amazing things like clocks that allowed ships to sail all the way around the world and not get lost. And, you know, the sextant and other wonderful inventions that sailing brought us. So the modern world we have happened because of exploration. And I think, you know, for us to solve the problems on Earth, we need to think bigger and, and not smaller. And so what do you feel we get back? What, uh, how is it going to make our life on Earth any different? Well, I mean, one of the big ways in which I think it can help is giving us a bigger perspective. The view I had from space is one that only 600 people in the entire history of the human race have ever had. And it's, it's an absolute privilege to have that view. But I think if a million people have had the same perspective of our planet that I have had, then we, I think we'll take better care of the planet. Um, another thing that's really important is you know, that we actually look after this planet and be more cautious in the ways we use it. And in space, we can do a lot of the things that are too difficult or too polluting or too, you know, um, messy to do on Earth. And one of the things I learned from Jeff Bezos when we were, I was visiting for the launch was he has an idea to move a lot of manufacturing into space. Uh, that allows us to, to contain it there and not have it leak into our environment here on Earth. And I think that's a really important thing to do. It is fascinating that you are having those kind of conversations because, as I mentioned, what the world sees is these two billionaires having these unedifying Twitter feuds about who's beating who. Do you get the sense that both Musk and Bezos have a greater purpose with this? Yeah, I've talked to both of them at length and they really do have a, a grander vision there. And I think there is a level of brinkmanship that comes with you know, being at the front of something and I think healthy competition which we've always had. I mean, Australia has Holdens and Fords for a good reason, is that more companies help you know, innovate and drive innovation. So I'm okay with the competition, but that's not really what it's about. It's about building infrastructure for a sustainable set of activities that the human race can do in space. And I think they both really believe that's what they're doing, and I, I, I support them in that. Do you realistically believe that we can sustain life at some point on another planet? 
I think another planet is very difficult. Um, those planets, even Mars, which has a tiny atmosphere, is not very friendly to humans. Um, so I think that's a little way off. But we can start to build, for instance, space stations um, in near-Earth orbit that, that we can do a lot of really cool things on. And I think that might be a really good logical first step. What do you think th about the fact, though, that private enterprise is now taking over from government agencies like NASA in this race and in this occupation of the space? Well, it's really amazing that I could fly on a rocket in America as an Australian without having to get my American citizenship like my predecessors had to do. So that is a sign that things are changing, and I think for the better, space is opening up and regular citizens can go. And just like my last company that I started, we were able to build low-cost satellites that outcompeted traditional government satellites because of innovations happening in the commercial sector. So I think it's really exciting now that space has been democratized and it's finally becoming something for everyone. And of course, you're talking about uh, being Australian, you know, this young boy dreaming in Tumbarumba about going to space. What's your next uh, space adventure going to be? Well, you guessed rightly that I, I do want to go up <laughs> to space again. <laughs> I and guess. I think, yeah, for me, uh, building a space station um, that we can visit and, uh, you know, I'd love to you know, um, hold a conference there or, um, you know, hold the first concert in space. Um, but I think having a space station that allows us to begin the beginnings of like early activities that we can do in space as a race, I think that's really important. Uh, I can't let you go without asking about your um, partner in space. You talk about how surreal it was. How surreal was it going up with Captain Kirk, William Shatner? Well, it couldn't get more surreal than that, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, a lifelong hero of mine. I used to stay up with my mum watching Star Trek when I was a kid, as did many people around the world. And so I think he was a fantastic ambassador for what, you know, the things we just talked about. You know, in Star Trek, they live in a post-money economy with peace and they go around exploring the galaxy um, and, and helping other civilizations. And that's the best of humanity. And to fly up with you know one of the representatives of that narrative, I think was you know I couldn't think of a better ambassador for for what I believe in than William Shatner. Yeah, but you must have been both nervous at some point. Was it a little terrifying? Yeah, definitely during training. Even the simulator that Blue Origin has, where we were doing our training, is so accurate um, and realistic that sometimes it brought us to tears. Even just in the training, um, it was very moving. And then the real flight was something else altogether. And I remember before we took off. Um, Bill was a little nervous and I was teaching him breathing exercises. We're both strapped in our chairs and I'm giving him some instructions on how to breathe and, and uh, relax. So it was a, definitely a lot of beautiful bonding moments with the crew. Absolutely beautiful. Great to chat, Chris. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.